ethical code in psychological research. Just a little announcement before, sorry for starting a little bit late, technical difficulties, Zoom and whatnot. <laughs> Anyways, alrighty. Before we get started, please join me in a land acknowledgement. Although some of us may not be on campus grounds, it is still important for us to acknowledge the indigenous lands we are currently occupying, as well as the physical position of UCSD. As UCSD sits on the unsettled territory and traditional homelands of the Kumeyaay people, we as members of the UC San Diego community must acknowledge the legacy of the Kumeyaay people. Please join me in a moment of silence to honor the original people of this land. Thank you. Um, another announcement, if you can guide your view to the link to map that shows which indigenous lands you're living on, it's just a link that tells you which indigenous lands you are currently living on. And a couple more announcements I would like to make before we get started. The first is a trigger warning. We will be going over topics pertaining to eugenics, ableism, and Nazi war crimes. Therefore, if there is a point where you feel the need to step away from the screen, by all means, please do so because your mental health and well being is a priority. Second, I am using Google Slides closed captioning, and the captions may not be completely accurate. Third, I am a little nervous, but still excited to present. And so, if I stutter, have pauses in between my sentences, I ask of you all to please be understanding and patient with me. A little bit more housekeeping. For community guidelines, this is a brave space, and but it's not the same as a safe space. I can't guarantee that everything said in this presentation will sit well with everyone. And so if I say anything that you do not agree with or is believed to be inaccurate, I encourage you to speak your mind, but challenge the idea and not the person, which we will get into in the third bullet point. The second is to lean into your discomfort. All answers are appreciated and there are no wrong answers. Most of the questions in the presentation are formatted to be participant-centered, which basically means they're mostly for y'all to express what you are thinking or feeling as we move through the presentation. Third is challenge the idea and not the person. If someone says something that you do not agree with or something in the presentation, don't challenge the person who said it, but try to comment on the idea instead of the person. Next is the Vegas rule. So what is said here stays here. Some questions may require you to share personal experiences. This is a guideline because you want to respect and protect everyone's privacy. And last, participation. It is highly encouraged. I do have some questions prepared for y'all, so please don't be shy and use the chat feature and participate. <laughs> Okie dokes. So what about the presenter? What about me? I am a second year clinical psychology major. I am the Common Grounds and Marketing intern as well as a social justice educator for the Cross Cultural Center. During my free time, I enjoy painting, playing the bass guitar recently and snowboarding. And y'all can see that I added some recent paintings that I did. And why did I choose this topic? Well, for starters, as a clinical psychology major, I never really considered research as a part of my career and I was mainly set on being a clinical psychologist and that's what I want to do, have a private practice and the like, but after taking Psych 70 over the summer, my interest and appreciation for research has grown. Which leads me to make a disclaimer, I just took a research course and I am not a total expert on what I'm going to present and by all means if there is something that you would like to add, please do. Now enough about me. I would like to hear from y'all. So the first two questions you can answer both or either or. The first is which areas of study in psychology interest you the most or and what kind of research are you interested in? And don't be shy, use the chat feature. I'll be reading out a couple of responses and yeah. <laughs> 
Maybe you want to say your name, your major, whatever makes you feel comfortable or whatever you're comfortable with sharing. Okay, Ryan said he is studying, oh, oh, the areas that interest him is studying underrepresented populations. I think that's what you mean. If not, please correct me. Alina says that I really enjoy ideas brought forth by Sigmund Freud. Yeah, he is an interesting being. He's featured in a lot of psych textbooks. Zena or Zena, if I'm pronouncing your name right. Cross-cultural research is always interesting. Samples outside the weird population. Interesting that you mentioned that because we may or may not be going over that later in the presentation. And I will read another response. Lazel, Lizel, I'm so sorry if I pronounced your name wrong, but you are interested in the Eastern ideas of psychology. Interesting, I like that, I like that one. And I'm gonna read this last response, these last two responses before we get started. Hello, Isabella. Hello, Isabella. And your areas of interest are mostly regarding the veterans of mental health, specifically PTSD, anxiety, and depression brought on by military service. Nice. And Nayeli, you are going into critical social psychology, and your long-term research goals involve decentering whiteness and non-monogamous relationship research. That is great. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for your responses. And I will definitely be looking more into the areas of psychology that interest y'all. Very interesting. Thank you. Okay, doke. So a quick overview before we get started. I will be going over the violations of ethics and research and moving on to the ethical codes then the modern and recent challenges in psychological research and finally closing remarks. But before we get into the violations of ethics and research, I feel that is important to highlight eugenics. Now, what are eugenics? Well, eugenics can be defined as a germline engineering and Google defines eugenics as the study of arranging reproduction in the human population to increase the occurrence of desired her heritable characteristics. The term eugenics was initially coined in 1883 by the British explorer and natural scientist Francis Galton. Galton was primarily influenced by the concept of reproducing more desirable traits in the human population and weeding out the undesirable characteristics through reproduction. Now, eugenics in America. The 1970 law that led to the involuntary mass sterilization of Native American women was the Flat Family Planning Services and Population Research Act of 1970. This law results in physicians sterilizing at least 25% of Native American women who were around the average age of childbearing. The sterilizations happened by force and or coercion and the majority of Native American women were not made aware that this process was being done to them. The things about this law is that it financially supported the sterilization of patients who received their health care through Indian Health Services. And that was the name of the health service. In addition, around the same time, for patients who had Medicaid, Black and Latinx women were, or Latina women were also targets of coerc coercive sterilization. The next is California was an epicenter of the American eugenics movement. In a paper written by Dr. Alexandra Mina Stern, the author mentions eugenics in California was allowed through it being issued as a necessity for public health. The paper notes about 20,000 sterilizations were performed on patients in state in institutions from 1909 and 1979, as well as the subsidized procedures that occurred in the Los Angeles County Hospital during the early 1970s. Sterilization was also known to be justified in California as the solution for overpopulation and used to compromise the reproductive ability of patients who were in asylums and prisons because actions to asexualize patients and individuals were promoted as a way to improve their quote, physical, mental, or moral condition. Finally, 
for eugenics in America, propaganda for eugenics were mainly centered on disability, race, education, social class, and more often an intersection of identities. The main reason for propaganda surrounding the concept of eugenics was to promote those with desirable and favorable traits to have children with wild characteristics that were deemed socially undesirable were forced or encouraged to be sterilized. Okay, after going over what eugenics is and the importance of it, we're going to be going over the history of ethical violations. And another announcement that I would like to make, although the crux of the presentation pertains to research in psychology, I want to note that other ideas other areas of study in science were practicing research and it was the accumulation of violations in research methods that essentially led to the formation of the ethical codes, which we will be going over later on. To begin, I will be going over the Nazi war crimes. During World War II, German researchers and physicians conducted lethal and painful experiments on thousands of prisoners without their consent. During this time, mass sterilization also began in hospitals and various institutions. Physicians, psychiatrists, anthropologists, and medically trained genetics, geneticists participated in eugenics, which as we went over before can be known or defined as germline genetic engineering or racial hygiene, which also was the result of mass sterilization of Jewish Europeans. And I've also added a brief definition of eugenics on this slide. It was important for me to go over the basics of eugenics um, during the beginning of the presentation because it was a serious issue that is worth mentioning because for so that went on because it went on for so long, thousands of years, and it was an issue that placed many indigenous, black folks, and people of color in situations that disproportionately affected their rights. As we continue, the medical experiments that occurred in concentration camps were intended for the advancement of Nazi racial and ideological goals. So I'm pretty sure y'all have heard of this, but twin experiments are really popular, especially in psychology. Eugenicists believe that um, twins could help create more perfect humans, usually used for the debated you know, nature nurture problem, which plot twist, it's not nature or nurture, it's both. Anyways, the second bullet point is that the experiments were sought to find how different races experiment experienced various diseases, it established Jewish racial inferiority, and the sterilization experiments towards the Jewish, Roman, and other groups Nazi leaders determined to be undesirable. Experiments also occurred for military purposes, so individuals in concentration camps would be forced to participate in high altitude experiments, freezing experiments, and testing different methods of making seawater drinkable. And for the most part, these experiments either resulted in permanent damage to the individual or death. Moving on, medical experiments also um, occurred in concentration camps, mainly to test drugs and treatments. They were geared towards developing and testing treatments for illnesses and injuries. Individuals were purposely exposed to diseases such as malaria, tuberculosis, typhoid fever, yellow fever, and infectious hepatitis for the sake of studying diseases. They would try to test immunization immunization compounds and antibodies for the prevention and treatment of diseases. The picture that I included here was the result of a um, like a, a bone and chemical compound that researchers tried to see if the bone experiments could either regenerate new bones or it could cure a muscle or a tissue. And lastly, prisoners were forced to endure the effects of mustard gas to test the possible treatments and properties that chemicals may carry, but as a result, there weren't many benefits to testing these chemicals. It is also very important to note that research has been done in prisons, 
Um, prisoners were chosen to participate in studies out of convenience because they were a they were living in controlled conditions, so there weren't many external variables that could interfere with the experiment if researchers decided to select prisoners as subjects for their study. Similar to Nazi physicians forcing individual, individuals in concentration camps to participate in their research, researchers used prisoners as subjects to test drugs, medicines, and medical devices. Most of the research that is conducted in, prison, in prisons would not consider the risks, rights, and potential benefits of the selected individuals. Also, on the topic of convenience in the first bullet point, because some studies require experiments to go on for years, and researchers knew where they were and would be for many years, which kind of leads into the second bullet point of, having pris or of prisoners living under controlled conditions. I also want to note, um, this was found in the CITI training. I don't know if any of y'all have research experiment or research experience, but this was a requirement for me before I could participate in research. But um, the, it says, as documented in Acres of Skin, human experiments at Holmesburg Prison, prisoners were used in lieu of laboratory animals to test the toxicity of cosmetics. In other experiments, prisoners were irradiated in research conducted by the Atomic Energy Commission, rendering some sterile and others badly burned. These are only two examples of many experiments using prisoners as subjects. So you may be wondering, maybe, maybe not, but what about the use of incentives? In other words, were there situations where prisoners received, um, received coercion or influence that affected their decision to participate? Well, yes, and some examples include photography and money. With photographs, some researchers would offer women photographs of them and their children from visits that would be taken and framed by a professional photographer. Um, in regards to money, the maximum daily pay for prisoners is about $1. Therefore, by giving a prisoner $25 for their partition, participation, it would equate to three to five weeks of pay, depending on how many days a week each, each individual works. However, with incentives, researchers need to be careful of proposing undue influence. Undue influence compromises the autonomy of prisoners because it provides an incentive that influences the decision of the prisoner outside of their will, like um, because photographs, because in settings and situations where women have limited access to their children, this way of compensation may elicit a sense of pressure to participate. Now, what about confidentiality and the risks of prisoners? We'll be discussing codes that protect the confidentiality and rights of research participants in the later slides, such as I'll be mentioning consent forms and limits for researchers and the like. Okay, now we will be moving on to actual experiments that violated ethical codes. The first I would like to note is the Stanford Prison Experiment. So it is a very popular one that has been mentioned in many psychology classes, and it is an experiment that closely replicated the impact of becoming a prisoner or prisoner guard, or prison guard. The experiment was conducted by Philip Zimbardo, and that people who were guards became the result of the experiment is that people who were guards became abusive and the prisoners showed signs of extreme stress and anxiety. The process of the study was cut short because of what was happening to the students. They were volunteers. Not, neither of them were actual prisoners or actual guards, but they were asked to play the role. And people who were guards became, as I mentioned earlier, abusive and the prisoners showed signs of extreme stress and anxiety. I would also like to note the, a quote that I read the guards began to behave in ways that were aggressive and abusive towards the prisoners while prisoners became passive and depressed. Five of the prisoners began to experience severe negative emotions, including crying and acute anxiety. Next is the hepatitis studies at the Willowbrook State School. I'm not sure if these were mentioned in psych classes, but I know that this has not been mentioned in the ones that I've taken. But before I wanna, before I proceed, I wanna give a disclaimer that there are better ways to describe individuals with mental disabilities instead of using the R word, but it was just the, the paper that I read just used the word and I, I don't wanna use it, but if I do have to use it because I'm reading about this 
I might, but I will try my best not to. Anyways, what this study was about is that students at Willowbrook State School for Children with Mental Retardation were infected with live hepatitis in order to develop a vaccine. The purpose of the study was to observe the spread of hepatitis in individuals with mental disabilities. The school eventually closed the regular admissions and only admitted individuals whose parents agreed to allow their children to partake in the hepatitis experiment. And for the second bullet point, permissions for these actions were allowed by the parents because it guaranteed acceptance of their children into the packed and overcrowded facility. More on the hepatitis studies at the Willowbrook State School. The experiments involved purposely infecting children with the with hepatitis by either feeding stool extracts from those infected or receiving injections. And when the, when the researchers went to court, they defended their experiment by claiming that many of the children who were admitted into the facility would have been infected with hepatitis anyways because of the regular conditions that were in the facility by either being close to children with the disease and the like. Now, another popular one is Milgram's obedience study. This was an experiment directed towards reasoning how Nazi leadership was able to give orders and essentially take responsibility for the injustices directed towards many groups. But um, this experiment had individuals obey and carry out the acts similarly to the Nazi war experiments, or the, yeah, the Nazi, the Nazi war experiments. And Milgram's obedience study aim to observe how far individuals in a controlled lab experiment would go to obey positions of authority, even when asked to administer punishment to other beings. And this is a question that I want y'all to think about. And for my psychology folks, do you know what the punishment was for the quote unquote learner, which I will get into? Well, if you guessed shocks and voltage, you are correct. Essentially, well, not in a good way, but like you are correct. The process of the experiment went by asking volunteers to inflict progressive shocks to the learners when they submit an incorrect answer. However, the learner was not really literally shocked. It was more, more to see if the, if the subject would inflict those voltage shocks to the learner if they got an answer wrong. Which leads me to my next bullet point. Even when the learners complained about having health-related issues, heart conditions, most subjects obeyed the exper experimenter's demand. The experimenter would either say, please continue to the subject, or you must continue, or the experiment requires you requires that you continue. And just, just to reiterate again, learners weren't actually being shocked, but you can imagine what was going through the subject's head when the experiment, when the experimenter kept telling them, you have to continue, like they're getting the answer wrong, you have to shock them. Psychiatrists predicted that only 1% would actually administer the most highest voltage to shock the learners. However, in Milgram's original experiment, about 65% of the participants went all the way to the highest voltage. So what did we learn from the obedience studies? When under pressure to obey, even the most ethically moral people may say and do things they never expect slash intend to happen. And one thing that I want to note is in bold, it says the real evil may be in the situation. So what this means is that, um, the, so that what this means is that not all bad things are done by bad people. It could mean that someone has more to learn about the consequences of their actions, but I can't speak for the intent of all scientists, but a professor mentioned how in some cases, researchers would conduct studies out of curiosity, not the intent of malice. Um, if I didn't explain the study clearly, I hope that this video explains it. The problem I wanted to study was a little different, it went a little bit further. It was the issue of authority. Under what conditions would a person obey authority who commanded actions that went against conscience? These are exactly the questions that I wanted to investigate.
wanted to study was a little different, went a little bit further. It was the issue of authority. Under what conditions would a person obey authority who commanded actions that went against conscience? These are exactly the questions that I wanted to investigate at Yale University. It is May 1962. An experiment is being conducted in the Elegant Interaction Laboratory at Yale University. The subjects are 40 males between the ages of 20 and 50 residing in the greater New Haven area. Psychologists have developed several theories to explain how people learn. One theory is that people learn things correctly whenever they get punished for making a mistake. Forty years later, Milgram's infamous experiment, Obedience, is still taught in classrooms around the world. Would you open those and tell me which of you is which, please? Learn. All right, now the next thing we'll have to do is set the uh, learner up so that he can get some sort of punishment. What inspired Milgram, I would say there were a number of factors. One of them is he was very ambitious. He wanted to make a mark in social psychology. And he wanted, as he wrote to one friend, he wanted to come up with the most, with the boldest experiment that he could think of. Would you roll up your right sleeve, please? This electrode is connected to the shock generator in the next room. And this electrode paste is to provide a good contact to avoid any blister or burn. Do you have any questions now before we go into the next room? About two years ago, I was in the Veterans Hospital in West Haven. Mm -hmm. And while there, they detected a heart condition. There's nothing serious, but as long as I'm having these shocks, um, how strong are they? How dangerous are they? Well, no, although they may be painful, they're not dangerous. Anything else? No, that's all. All right, teacher, would you take the test and be seated in front of the shock generator, please, in the next room? But the experiment was rigged. The victim was an accomplice of the experiment. The victim, according to plan, provided many wrong answers. His verbal responses were standardized on tape, and each protest was coordinated to a particular voltage level on the shock generator. Now, as teacher, you were seated in front of this impressive-looking instrument, the shock generator. Its essential feature is a line of switches that goes from 15 volts to 450 volts and a set of verbal designations that goes from slight shock to moderate shock, strong shock, very strong shock, intense shock, extreme intensity shock, and finally XXX, danger severe shock. Your job, the experimenter explains to you, is to a word pair test. If he gets each answer correctly, fine, you move on to the next pair. But if he makes a mistake, you are instructed to give him an electric shock, starting with 15 volts, and you increase the shock one step on each error. Incorrect. You'll now get a shock of 105. Hard hit. Just how far can you go in this thing? As far as it's necessary. What do you mean as far as it's necessary? Okay. So as we saw, the subject was asking like, how far can it go? Or, um, and the researcher said, as far as it's necessary. So it just goes to show how much we are willing to obey people in positions of authority. Moving on to the Tuskegee syphilis study. So the reason for this experiment was that um, researchers assumed that syphilis could affect each race differently. And this was inspired by the 1882 germ theory. Invest like I have a quote that says right there, investigators questioned if relatively primitive and underdeveloped black brains would be spared. Essentially, the researchers use languages such as primitive and underdeveloped to refer to black folks and their cognitive processes. The researchers were curious whether or not black folks would be spared by the disease because of the believed underdevelopment of these subjects' cognition. One thing that I would like to highlight is in the green box, researchers involved in the Tuske Tuskegee syphilis study did not distribute treatments to subjects who had syphilis after using them as subjects in their experiment, and participants in the study were not informed that they had syphilis and were being used for a study about syphilis. So a major issue with this results that participants in the study were not made aware that they had syphilis, which we'll get into in the ethical codes, and that they were just being used because they were a population that was assumed to take and experience diseases differently.
Now, before we move on to response to research injustices, I would also like to highlight a comment that I saw. If anyone finds Milgram's obedience study interesting, Elijah recommends watching a YouTube video called The Wave, and it is about a teacher that uses Nazi teachings to influence his students to see if they were capable of behaviors approximating Nazi behavior, similar to the obedience study. And before we move on, are there any questions or clarifications or responses to the violations that you would like to express in the chat? I'll give it a minute and then, yeah. I know the, the thing that I found interesting was the hepatitis studies done at Willowbrook, with the Willowbrook facilities. It was fascinating and really disheartening to learn more about how children were being fed feces or purposely being infected with hepatitis um, against their will, because we'll get into the ethical codes later, but they weren't old enough to make decisions themselves and their parents were the ones that allowed this to happen to them. And there was also another study where children were fed like radioactive matter through their cereal. It's another story. It's another study, but um, I'll I'll look I'll look it up. Or if y'all are interested to look it up, it's it's on the internet somewhere. But yeah, I'll be waiting for some responses. Maybe one or two before we move on. Hopefully. I'll also give it a minute. <laughs> um. Okay, well, if you're still typing, please still submit the response or comment or reaction because I will still be reading them out later and responding to them, but we will be moving on to the response to research injustice right now. Okay, do the Nuremberg Code. I always have trouble pronouncing this. So if I say Nuremberg, it's not Nuremberg. No, it is Nuremberg. I pronounce it as Nuremberg. I, yeah. Um, anyways, the Nuremberg Code first emerged in 1947. It was the early ethic, it was the earliest code of ethics for research with human participants. It essentially stemmed from constant, it was inspired by the Nazi war crimes that occurred in concentration camps in Europe during World War II, where research, where a majority of research by physicians were being held. And the goal of the Nuremberg Code was to protect the rights of humans involved in research from harm similar to the experiments practiced by the Nazi physicians. Essentially, in other words, they were intended to prevent the mistreatment of research subjects. Oh, I would also like to highlight some responses for, from earlier about the, ex, the ethical code violations. Ryan says, it's kind of disheartening to know that even with ethics communities, this type of research was still okayed. It has definitely gotten better, which you have noted, but yeah, it, it was disheartening to read and learn about that it had to take that much and many more for a code of ethics to emerge. And a comment by Edwina, also some German eugenics folks came to the US to see how black people were treated during slavery and Jim, and Jim Row. Yes, that is correct. And I will look more into that after this presentation. Thank you, Edwina, that is really much appreciated. The next ethical code that were directed towards researchers is the Declaration of Helsinki. The purpose of the Declaration of Helsinki was to provide an ethical guide to physicians participating in clinical or biomedical research that signifies the protection of participants. And the highlight of this, or one of the highlights of this response is that it required informed consent in writing. So um, for some, if for some reason consent cannot be provided in writing, the non-written consent must be documented and witnessed. But to highlight the main 
gist of de the Declaration of Helsinki, it required informed consent in writing. And the image I added, I would like to highlight, um, it is by Ben Sean and it's titled Credo. So background on Ben Sean, he protested against social injustice and honored ordinary people in lithographs, paintings, photographs, and public murals. For Sean, art was a powerful tool for socio-political commentary and for urging the effect of change as he asserted, quote, if we, have if we are to have values, a spiritual life, and a culture, these things must find the imagery and interpretation, and interpretation, end of quote. And he also notes that if we were to have values, a spiritual life, and culture, these things must find the imagery and interpretations through the arts. So this art piece is essentially um, about, it can correlate to the Declaration of Helsinki, but I thought it was cool to add. Moving on to the Belmont Report, it is the most, I would assume, the, the most popular, I guess, mentioned in psych classes. I'm not sure, but I've heard this one more often than the Nuremberg Code. Um, but the, the Belmont Report was published in 1979 by the, the National Commission for the Protection, by the National Commission for the Protection of Human, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm like stuttering, but it was from the Office for Human Research Protections and the Belmont Report was compromised by the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research. The Belmont Report is the fundamental document of the current system designed to protect human subjects. And the key ethical principles that we may have heard are respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. And moving on, or referencing the experiment that was mentioned earlier, the Tuskegee experiment, do any of y'all know which principle of the Belmont Report this violates? Because I'm pretty sure this has been said in some site classes, but I wanna hear from y'all if y'all know that which ethical principle was violated by the Tuskegee syphilis study. I'll give it a minute, maybe a refresher, or I will give a refresher, but I'll give it a minute to see if anyone remembers. If not, it's okay. It was justice that was, all of them. Well, yes, respect for persons, literally all of them, yes, but um, essentially I'll be going over the um, the principles of the Vaughn Report, but yeah, for the most part, literally <laughs> a majority of them. So for respect for persons, individuals should be treated as autonomous agents and are entitled to protection. And what the requirements for respect for persons are include participants must have the autonomy to make their own decisions and researchers are obligated to protect the privacy of their subjects. So in a nutshell, participants are need to be able to make their own decision. However, people who lack autonomy include children or adults with compromised decision making, such as dementia or Alzheimer's. Therefore, these populations are entitled to protection. And going over that children, going over the experiment that was mentioned earlier about the hepatitis studies in Willowbrook, the children lacked autonomy, so therefore that study violated this principle. The next one I'll be going over is beneficence. Beneficence covers acts of kindness beyond obligation, so the study must not harm participants. It need they beneficence extends possible benefits towards individuals who are not part of the treatment group if the treatment was affected. So the study cannot harm participants, and if the study happens to find a treatment for a disease, the control group of the experiment should also receive the benefits of the findings of the study. And for terminology, control group essentially is a group in an experiment, there's the control group and usually an experiment group. The control group doesn't receive the treatment or whatever the researcher is testing while the experiment group is undergoing the item or thing that re the researcher is trying to observe or study. And finally, we're going to be moving to justice and it is fairness and distribution. So uh, the big question that stems from this is who receives the benefits of research and who bears its burdens. The justice occurs when a benefit, when a person is entitled to or 
I'm sorry. Excuse me, justice can be defined as the ethical obligation to give the benefits and burdens of research fairly. Researchers are required to equitably select participants. Therefore, researchers cannot exploit vulnerable and exclude other populations, which was seen in the Tuskegee syphilis study, where only Black men who were diagnosed with syphilis were used. And they didn't even know they had syphilis. They were just tested and used in the study without being aware that they were being used. Now, I would like to ask y'all, some of y'all to participate if you can. The next question are, what are some experiments that you know have violated ethics in research? The ones that have not been mentioned or other experiments that have not been talked about and that you would like to mention or discuss. I'll leave this. I'll wait for responses while I drink my water. or maybe you would like to mention an experiment that caught your attention. Um, Brian says the wave experiment Elijah mentioned earlier for sure violated ethics. Children participated. Oh, and it's okay if you don't remember the details. I really appreciate your participation. Um, Lauren says unit seven, either 731 or 731, a Japanese regiment performed human experimentation. No, it was not mentioned earlier, so thank you. Oh my goodness, Elijah, thank you so much for this, and I'm excited to read it. Um, Elijah said, not all institutional review boards hold the same values, so different countries with different cultures allow certain things to pass. Additionally, times and significant events can sway what researchers are willing to sacrifice for perceived benefits. Although there is a balancing of values that researchers consider before performing experiments, in some cases, if perceived gain is much greater than the perceived loss or danger to participants, experiments can be created. That is so interesting that you mentioned that because it sometimes it passes my mind that um, excuse me, ethical codes are different in countries with different cultures, which allow things to pass. Actually, I'm gonna write that down. And I'll, I'll leave time for anyone that. And you mentioned how you love the brown blue eye experiment. Thank you for these recommendations and mentions. Okay. Thank you for your responses and by all means, please continue to be using the chat. I really appreciate any answer and participation, but I will be moving on. Oh, oh, thank you, Nayeli. I'll read this one again. Also, just because an experiment doesn't violate ethical codes doesn't mean there isn't issues with it. That is completely correct. Researchers often center their own needs and interests within the academic community, as opposed to centering their research on the needs of the communities they study. Yeah, and this sometimes this can go into the push to, there's like a saying, it's either publish or perish, which motivates researchers to keep pushing out or keep releasing new studies and publications while maybe not even considering the welfare of the people that they choose to study. So thank you, I appreciate this answer. And like I said earlier, by all means, oh, thank you, Violeta. Um, Violeta says to watch three identical strangers, twin studies. Yes, I will also comment on this. There was, they were raised um, in different environments and that, um, it's really, it's like the twin studies, but these are, they're triplets and they were raised in different environments to see how they would, um, grow up. And Zena says, I know we talked about the Milgram obedience experience, but I do consider that a net positive 
despite the psychological harm it could cause to participants. Because, sorry, excuse me, because there were racially charged prejudices against Germans as being inferior or prone to manipulation, that Americans are mentally superior. And I think this experiment really broke the narrative, which was really important. I'm really glad that you mentioned that because there were racially charged prejudices that weren't highlighted in most courses because of the tie to social justice. So mainly the psych, the science, the experiment side were mainly talked and not about the um, the racial, the racially charged prejudices. And Edwina says. Also so important during COVID-19, since these questions with vaccines, with health disparities, history of people of color in experimental conditions, et cetera. Yes, um, thank you for tying this presentation to current times because with the COVID vaccine on the move and, and with how fast that the vaccine has been um, made, it, it really does, excuse me, it really does um, make us question. So thank you. I really appreciate your participation. And now we will be moving on to the modern and recent challenges of psychological research. But I want to say thank you again for everyone who, who have participated. And there will be a couple more um, questions or topics that you, you can comment on. But just a, just a quick thanks to people who have responded. Okay, moving on to modern and recent challenges of psychological research. So I remember an individual mentioned weird populations during the beginning of this presentation, which got me really excited because at first, before I even did any research about this topic, I didn't know what weird populations were. I was like, weird, that kind of sounds offensive, but no, weird stands for Western educated, industrialized, rich and demographic. So what are weird populations? Because research is mainly conducted in college students and the results that um, have been put forward, it does not accurately re represent the general population. So this issue brings questions of generalizability of other cultures and how applicable they can be to a bigger population. The results from sampling weird populations does not accurately represent other groups and the general population when a majority of information brought forth by, psycho by psychological research is set to believe as a universal truth when it has only been when only college students or Western or weird populations have only been involved in the study. And so what are experts in research doing about this? Experts in research, per, experts in research propose an increase in cross-cultural research and diversifying samples, which we will be going over, yes, right now. Okay, so representation in publications. Have any of y'all wondered um, who were the who were the researchers that wrote the um, the journals that you've read or the experiments that you have to read for class? Well, there has been a push for research journals to publish content about race and development. And according to a Stanford study, publications that highlight race are rare. And when race is discussed, it is presented and published by a majority of white scholars. Although there's a push to put out information about race and racism, the works and studies that are being published have often been written and conducted by white researchers, essentially muting the voices of researchers who are black, indigenous, or people of color. And essentially fewer, opportun fewer opportunities are made available for black, indigenous, and students of color, not because um, their names aren't white sounding, but it's mainly because of the limited resources that students have. And to note, a Stanford psychologist, Stephen Roberts, mentions that across five decades of psychological research, publications that highlight race are rare. And when race is discussed, it is authored mostly and edited almost entirely by white scholars. Okay. And moving along to the replicability crisis, this also is connected to the weird populations because findings in psychology have been published, but people struggle to replicate results. And for my folks who are involved in research, y'all know how important it is to be able to replicate a study to establish credibility and validity of this experiment. <laughs> 
And the replicability crisis, self-explanatory crisis is not good because if it is a true finding and accepted as a universal truth, it should be replicable. replicable. Um, what, what is being done about this is that there has been a push to replicate studies in more diverse samples. So there have been evidence that in developmental schools, scientists are running diverse samples and that there is hope and, and that and they hope that the diversity in samples may tackle the replicability crisis from having non-representable and generalizable samples. And a response to the representation challenges, as I mentioned earlier, there have been an emergence of developmental labs in schools, all following the ethical codes, codes in research. So I know I had a, dis had a discussion with a professor about how there have been um, scientists in schools and um, with like developmental schools and babies and it, it's a diverse population and how it can be a start to respond to the representation, the repre the representation challenges that research currently faces. And the, replica the replication of studies being done in different samples to discover universal truths in psychology and not based on the understanding of a finding from a non-representative group of people. So bringing in weird populations, college students, SONA studies, mainly the results from there are usually applied to um, a greater population and usually accepted as a universal truth when we should be tackling representation challenges. Um, before we move on, are there any questions that y'all have about the response to challenges in psychological research so I can clarify anything or anything that y'all would like to point out that stood out to you? Because I know the weird populations kind of took me by surprise, but I'm very grateful that I know about that. So before I move on to the final closing remarks, are there anything that you want me to go over to solidify understanding of this presentation or what you want to say before we um, move on to the final remarks? Okay. Um, Hello, Zena and or Zena. I hope you're. I am pronouncing your name right. But you say that for the vaccines, you feel that there needs to be more transparency on how vaccines are made because a lot is funding. The rate at which vaccines are produced depends on the amount of funding and the nature of the disease. There have been questions on how COVID can have a vaccine while something like HIV doesn't after so after so many years, and it comes down to the nature of HIV being incredibly adaptive and mutative much, much more than COVID. And because there is more funding into this vaccine because of the current circumstances, it also accounts for the speed. Of course, the vaccine, I believe, is more based on the sample from China, if I remember correctly, and more follow-up testing will, be ha will have to be done for the effectiveness. But I think it's important to explain why the vaccine is legit and not a complete hoax and focus on accessibility and education for marginalized communities. Thank you for speaking up and noting that, which I feel that is very valid and important to note. So thank you. And a response from Brian, representation challenges resonated with me. Even among Asian Americans, I was doing this for a project, but if I search Philippine P in Psych Info, I get 1,532 peer reviewed articles. But if I search Chinese, I get 68,000 peer reviewed articles. Oh, Filipino. Okay. Um, if you search Filipino in Psych Info, you'd only get a, a couple thousand. But if you search Chinese, you'd get over 5,000. Yeah, um, it's really important to highlight because it's not only white publishers that are getting all of the. Um, credit or the spotlight for publication. It's also the Chinese researchers and there are other groups that have, there are other groups that do want to publish but have not been able to make it big and have their name out there. So thank you for mentioning that, Brian. It's really important. And thank you again for your participation and being brave and responding and participating. It's really much appreciated. Okay, so after going over the heavily dense information about 
um, oh, I'm gonna switch the slide. After going over the heavily dense information about the historical experiences of marginalized individuals involved in scientific research, such as um, the, the men in the Tuskegee study, the children from the Willowbrook study, and the other experiments that individuals were forced or at a disadvantage in, of, in participation. We can move on to going over the ethical codes for psychological research. Um, yeah, so that these were made in response to the many violations and experiments that were mentioned in the presentation and were not mentioned in the presentation by individuals in the chat. So it just goes to show that there had to be so much to happen for a response and to serve and to defend the rights of individuals and subjects who were a part of research and scientific experiments. And we also talked about the modern and current challenges for representation, especially in publishings or in sample and pop in sample populations and the replicability crisis, as well as issues of generalizability from weird populations or populations that are samples that aren't gen aren't essentially or could not be generalizable to the general public. <laughs> and we have also discussed the emergence of ways to produce generalizable findings by going over the developmental labs that are being established in schools and the push for diverse for the diversity in samples. And I believe that is all I have for tonight. Yes, these are the sources. I'll, although I will leave it open for um, any questions, comments about psychology or um, any anything that you want to go over. Nayeli mentions how you have a good article to recommend for anyone who wants to read more about recent issues related to race and current psychology research towards a Oh, Towards a Critical Race Psychology by Thea Salter and Glenn Adams. Thank you, Nayeli, for the recommendation. I will write that down. But yeah, if there's any questions that y'all have about psychology or any questions or anything that y'all want me to go over again to solidify your understanding or any questions about psych in general for school, I'll be more than happy to answer. But also before we end, I would like to take this opportunity to show you guys, show y'all that we have a survey link and there's a chance to be answered in an opportunity drawing. I won't say, I won't disclose what will be given out as the prize, but y'all can submit a research survey with the tiny URL. It's tinyurl.com slash EC in psych research survey, or you can scan the QR code on the screen. And yeah, that concludes my presentation.